Uh, my name is Sophie Rosile. I'm a third year resident in psychiatry here at UCLA, and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Amy Barnhorst. Um, she actually hails from my alma mater, which is the University of California, Davis, where she is the vice chair for community psychiatry. For some strange reason, we actually didn't cross paths while I was there, but we actually met earlier this year when our colleague Anne McBride brought us together to present at the APA on juvenile violence. I sat in the audience for her part of the presentation and I was just amazed with the clarity and the depth to which she brought um, to the issue of gun violence and mental health. I'm so grateful that she's here at UCLA. A little bit more about her. She um, is the medical director of a psychiatric crisis unit in a 50 bed psychiatric hospital in Sacramento. She's a nationally recognized expert on firearms laws and mental illness and studies the interface between firearm violence, suicide, and the mental health system. As part of the Consortium for Risk-Based Firearm Policy, she works with both state and federal legislatures to craft evidence-based firearm laws, and she's testified before the California and Alaska Senates on these issues. She also writes about them for the New York Times and her blog for Psychology Today. And most recently, she will be leading a new project funded by the state of California to develop and disseminate a gun violence prevention curriculum to mental health and medical professionals across the state. She's amazing. And please welcome me in, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Amy Barnhorst. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. And thanks everyone here for having me and for coming to hear about what I think is a really important topic. Um, now that you all have heard a little bit about me, I want to hear a little bit about you. So how many folks here are medical students, if any? Great. How about residents? How about uh, faculty in the department? Great. Anyone just wandering off the street? Okay. Uh, how many people here are gun owners? Okay. Not a lot. Um, so some of the topics we're going to cover today are whether or not people with mental illness are contributing significantly to gun violence or to overall community violence, um, and how that same question holds true for suicide. What is this plethora of firearm policies that are, are aimed at people who have mental illness, and what can clinicians like ourselves do about them? Does my mic sound echoey to you guys or just to me? Yeah. Maybe I can move it a little further away. Is that any better? Okay, try that. Um, so oftentimes gun violence, oops, gun violence in our nation is brought up in the context of these horrific mass shootings that happen. And we've been seeing more and more of these. And very quickly, the media jumps to associate these mass shootings with people's mental illness, delusions, madness, their mental health history. And what often gets forgotten in this narrative is that Mass shootings, particularly public mass shootings, not the kind that happen in the context of domestic violence or criminal activity, the kind that happen in random places like churches and movie theaters and schools, they comprise a very, very small percentage of firearm deaths in our nation. So this is 2015 data from the CDC, all firearm homicides. The pink represents all those other firearm homicides that happen in steady daily trickle of deaths during criminal activity, during gang activity, during domestic violence incidents, during other interpersonal violence incidents. Public mass shootings are a tiny sliver, the green sliver up at the top. And the other big difference between public mass shootings and the rest of those firearm homicides is who they affect. And it may be that we get a lot more attention put onto public mass shootings because it feels like it could happen to people like us. Whereas the whole rest of that pink pie those kinds of deaths usually happen to people who live in lower socioeconomic neighborhoods and um, are involved in activities that we can tell ourselves that we're not involved in, that we wouldn't be exposed to, and that we're not susceptible to that risk. So this is a graph that shows the age at the bottom here and the, percent, or the firearm deaths out of 100,000 on this axis. This is just looking at men, but you can see that in firearm homicide death rates, that black young men have a hugely increased risk over Hispanic and especially white men. Firearm homicide is largely the problem of young black males in this country, and it is a huge problem. The risk is more than 10 times the white male of dying of homicide by firearm. 
Nonetheless, mass shootings often pull us back to that narrative about the mental health system. And so this is Jed Bush after the Charleston Church shooting saying we need to focus on mental health care, not on new gun laws. More recently, after a horrific weekend this summer, a Politico report where there were two or three mass shootings actually in the whole week, Gilroy, El Paso, and Dayton, Ohio, a Politico reporter said to President Trump, what executive actions are you prepared to take on guns? And his response was, I do want people to remember these words, mental illness. These people are mentally ill, and I think we have to start building institutions again. We can't let these people on the streets. Pretty clear gun policy, right? So really, this, the shifting of the narrative away from any kind of sensible firearm policy towards mental illness policy, and I imagine that I'm with a lot of you when I say that I'm not necessarily against better programs and better treatment and better support for our patients, but this isn't really the way I want to go about it. This, in turn, drives the public perception. So this is a 2015 poll about um, mass shootings and what people think is the cause. So 63% of Americans who responded said they thought they were due to mental health problems, while only 23% thought they were due to act from access to firearms. And this kind of stigma really hurts people with mental illness. This is a cover of the New York Daily that kind of puts the public perception in the vernacular, get the violent crazies off our streets. This is what people think about our patients, and there's been some research to show that media coverage of mental illness as being related to mass shootings really increases people's willingness to work with and live next to people with mental illness. So how about this question, are people with mental illness actually at an increased risk of violence? Oftentimes we're, we hear that they're not at all, but the truth is that under certain circumstances they are. Um, research has shown that at the beginning of a psychotic illness, there is a small bump in the risk of violence when people may be not able to cope with their auditory hallucinations or paranoid delusions. And also in the period surrounding psychiatric hospitalization, there's a little bump epidemiologically. This kind of makes a lot of sense if you think about it though, because most uh, states, their criteria for hospitalization is dangerousness. So of course there's gonna be a little correlation. Um, but the increased risk of overall violence is not that great. And it's a small number of people. So for people who have a major mental illness, and we'll talk, I'll, I'll use the term major mental illness and serious mental illness kind of interchangeably. What they're usually talking about is um, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar, serious major depression. Um, we're not talking about like generalized anxiety disorder, or phobia of snakes, or anything like that. Um, the odds ratio, as compared to somebody without a major mental illness, they're about 2.4 times more likely to complete an act of violence. So, you know, more than double, it's something. But for comparison, when we think about this being how much mental illness contributes to your risk of violence, what about substance abuse? It turns out if you have a substance use problem and you don't have a mental illness at all, your increased risk of violence is almost seven times higher. And if you have both, it's additive, it's about 10 times higher. But no one's really talking about substance abuse as being a big contributor. Um, alcohol in particular greatly increases people's risk of violence. So one study looked at homicide offenders and found that 42% of them were under the influence of alcohol at the time of the crime. And, and interestingly about the study, they also found that 33% of homicide decedents had a significant amount of alcohol in their system. Um, and a California study done by some of my colleagues at the Violence Prevention Center where I work at Davis found that if you have a conviction, this was among California firearm owners, California firearm owners who had a conviction for an alcohol-related offense were four to five times more likely to engage in future violent or firearm-related crime than firearm owners who didn't have an alcohol-related offense. So alcohol is definitely a risk factor for violence. This is an older study that compared people in that high-risk period after psychiatric discharge, psychiatric hospital discharge, so kind of where there's a bump and in increased violence risk in our patients anyway, and it compared them to matched community controls. So what they found kind of supports the other studies I showed you guys. When you compare people with major mental illness to matched community controls, about 10% of them commit an act of violence in the first year post-hospital discharge in both cases. Sorry, did I say 10? I meant 15. So it's pretty comparable. They're not actually that different from the, their peers who live in the same neighborhood. If you throw in substance use on top of their major mental illness, though, it almost doubles how many of those people will commit an act of violence in the next year. 
But most interestingly in this study, I think, is the other mental illness plus substance. So these are folks not with the serious mental illness we talked about, but the other ones that are even more closely correlated with violence. So personality disorders like antisocial personality, um, some attention deficit disorder, intermittent explosive disorder, the kinds of things that we think of as being higher risk, but not necessarily considered a mental illness by um, the severe mental illness standards. When you combine those with substance use, the risk of violence almost triples. So really, it's not the people with serious mental illness that we need to be so worried about. It's the people who are using drugs and alcohol and have sort of the, the lesser mental illnesses, however you want to refer to those. When we zoom out and look at all the violence in the community, what's causing it? So this is a slide I borrowed from my friend and colleague, Jeff Swanson, who you'll see some more of his research in here. He does really big scale studies of firearm policy and legislation as it pertains to mental illness. Serious mental illness is the sole cause of about 4% of community violence represented by this little orange sliver. And all this gray violence is caused by other things. Substance use, domestic violence, criminal activity, prior, you know, there's other risk factors that go in here, but it's not mental illness. So in this notion of we can shore up the mental health system, put a ton of money in there, find all these great medications that work really fabulously for our patients with no side effects, um, build up our workforce so everybody can get in to see a psychiatrist the same week. If we were to really perfect our mental health system, and eradicate mental illness completely, we would get rid of 4% of community violence. So again, I'm still a fan of you know, putting some resources in, but it's not gonna be a great solution for this problem. Okay, let's talk about suicide now. So we talked about how mass shootings are a very small sliver in the pie of firearm homicides, but firearm homicides are actually just a piece of the pie in firearm fatalities. And when you add suicides into the mix, that's what this blue area is representing, that's about two-thirds of, su of uh, firearm deaths in the United States. As many of you probably know, suicide rates have been rising over the last 15 years. This graph shows um, the breakdown by most rural at the top down to most urban at the bottom. The solid line in the middle is the overall suicide rate, which has gone up um, from about 12 per 100,000 to about 15 per 100,000 in the last 15. Well, this is data from 1999 through 2015. Um, but you can see there's a much steeper climb on the very top, which is the most rural areas. And it's now the second leading cause of death in young people ages 10 to 34. To be fair, there's not that much other stuff that kills you when you're 10 to 34. However, if you even look at the raw numbers, they're, they're more or less comparable to people in middle age. So a lot of our teenagers and young adults are dying by suicide in this country. Um, certain risks, certain groups are at higher risk, LGDP, LGBTQ youth, veterans, um, and so we're seeing increases in those populations especially. Unlike firearm homicide, which predominantly, which is very much skewed towards young black males, firearm suicide is very much skewed towards older white males, and you can see the risk just climbs and climbs with age here. Again, this is mostly looking at men. Um, and Firearms play a very large role in overall suicides. Here's why. This is one study that looked at suicide acts by method. And they have all the methods up here. You can see that firearms are represented by this little lime green sliver here. That's about 6% of suicide attempts. So it's a pretty small number of people. The blue is um, overdose. When we actually look at completed suicides, the firearms represent over half of completed suicides in the US. You can see the overdose, despite how common it is as an attempt, is not a very, um, it's not a very lethal method. But the problem with attempting with the firearm is that universally, almost universally, these are fatal. How many folks here have seen someone who survived a suicide attempt by firearm? Okay. Um, I have, I've seen a couple of them, and I will never forget them because it's pretty rare. And I'm actually surprised that 15% of people who attempt with a firearm do survive. But um, it's got the highest lethality rate of any method, and you're not often given a second chance if that's how you attempt. One of the reasons this matters is that suicide attempts, um, we often think about them as being something that people who are suffering for a long period of time, they put a lot of thought into, they research their methods, they go out and buy a gun, they go through the waiting period, they really, really think this through. 
But one study looked at folks who had made a near lethal suicide attempt. And obviously, it's really hard to get good data on people who complete suicide because it's hard to go back and ask them retrospectively. And we often don't have a lot of warning from them before it happens. But these were people who either attempted, they defined le near lethal attempt as any attempt with a gun, any attempt by hanging, and any attempt that required emergency medical intervention that, that they would have likely died. The percentage of those people who made that attempt and said later that they thought about doing it, they planned it for less than an hour, was 70%. And of those folks, the percentage of them that said they spent less than five minutes making this very important decision to end their life, almost a quarter of them. So a large number of suicides and near lethal attempts are very impulsive. And alcohol, once again, contributes to this. Alcohol is not only a depressant, but it's something that releases people's inhibitions, as most of us know. And as this study found that um, a third of people who completed suicide tested positive for the presence of alcohol. And those who used a firearm and also hanging, so the most lethal methods, were um, much more likely to be intoxicated at the time of their suicide than people who used other methods like overdose or cutting. So again, big contributor. There's also this myth about suicide that if we stop people in the act, they'll just find another way to do it. And interestingly, this, has, this has, has uh, not been borne out by the research. The percentage of people who survive a various suicide attempt and who go on to die by other means is 90%. So that means that, yes, 10% of people will go on and try again, and they will find another way. But 90% of people, if you can intervene in that moment of crisis, in that bad one hour or that bad five minutes, if the thing that they have to reach for is a bottle of ibuprofen instead of a firearm, they're much more likely to go on and live a life after that and not try to die by suicide again. So this is the expression that means matter. The thing that you use matters. And it matters how much of a second chance you're likely to get. Okay, so knowing that means matter, and knowing that our patients are at an increased risk of suicide, maybe not so much violence, but um, you know, studies have found that between 40 and 90, depending on who you believe, of suicide, the people who complete suicide have a serious mental illness. So can our mental health system effectively keep guns out of these hands of people who are dangerous and at risk of suicide and or violence? Let's look a little bit at the policy uh, preventing folks from having access to firearms in the United States. So many of you are probably familiar with the Second Amendment to our Constitution, which reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of the free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This went almost unrestricted, this right to keep and bear arms, until the attempted assassination of John F. Kennedy by Lee Harvey Oswald. And he... Um, sorry, it was not an attempted assassination. It was an assassination. And he, uh, he shot the president with a rifle that he had mail ordered to his P.O. box. So he basically like Amazon primed a weapon and used it to kill the president. And people thought, you know, hey, maybe it shouldn't be that easy for everybody to get a gun. Partially because of this, the Gun Control Act of 1968 was born. And this is our big piece of legislation that regulates the firearm industry and firearm owners. And it's where we get this list of prohibited persons that you may have heard of. So people who have felony convictions, unlawful users, or people addicted to a controlled substance, respondents to domestic violence restraining orders, and anyone who's been adjudicated as a mental defective or committed to a mental institution. These people are not allowed to own firearms. Um, most relevant for us are probably these last two, because they're part of the, the mental health system of firearm prohibitions. Adjudicated as a mental defective usually means there's been some sort of criminal process where you've been found incompetent to stand trial or not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, it can also mean that you're under a conservatorship by the court. Committed to a mental institution isn't just somebody who's been on a 5150, not just somebody who's in the ER waiting for a bed or in a crisis unit. It actually happens after the involuntary admission into the psychiatric hospital and requires a hearing before a judge or a hearing officer. So depending on what state you're in, what kind of system you're in, this could be weeks into somebody's involuntary treatment before they get to this process. So somebody who's really quite dangerous could come in, be there, get treatment, be discharged, and do this repeatedly, but never meet the threshold for a federal firearm prohibition. Um, this was all well and good, but the Gun Control Act provided us with no guidance as to how we were to know who these people were. 
And it took another presidential assassination, this was the attempt, on um, Ronald Reagan by uh, John Hinckley Jr., who was trying to impress Jodie Foster, the, who played a teenage prostitute in the movie Taxi Driver. So he attempted to shoot the president, and in the process, shot and wounded his press secretary, James Brady. And um, Brady and his wife became lifelong advocates for sensible firearm legislation and passed the Brady Act. And what it did was, that one of the many things it did was develop the NICS database. So this is the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, abbreviated NICS. The idea being that now all that information about prohibited persons could be collected by the states and put into a national database run by the FBI. And then people would have to check the national database before they sold somebody a firearm and make sure that that person wasn't in it as a prohibited person. So the states were supposed to take all of their criminal court records, their family court records about restraining orders, their mental health court records about civil commitment, get all these things collated and sorted out and give them to the federal government. And of course they were like, yeah, sure, no problem. You know, it's 1993, this is all like in paper and boxes in a basement somewhere. Um, and aside from that, there were other problems, which were that some states collected very different data. They had different prohibitory criteria than what the federal government had laid out in the Gun Control Act. Some states had basically no prohibitory criteria and they didn't collect anything. States can't be compelled to enforce federal law, so it was all voluntary anyway, whether or not states wanted to report. And understandably, people had some concerns about reporting sensitive mental health records to an outside agency. So even still, there are millions of names missing from the NICS database of people who should be prohibited. That's not the only problem. The other problem is that in many states, you can actually buy a firearm from a private party or at a gun show without actually doing a background check. And so it wouldn't matter if your name was in the database. So good thought uh, kind of needs to be a, tightened up if it's going to work. In California, we have a higher threshold for prohibition than the federal law. So we actually prohibit people who were admitted to a hospital for dangerousness, whether or not they make it to their commitment hearing. So if you admit somebody to a psychiatric hospital for DTS or DTO and they're 5150, um, they get a five-year firearm prohibition within the state. For grave disability, they actually have to be committed with the hearing process. Um, we also in California prohibit people who have been subject to a Tarasov warning. This is um, Tatiana Tarasov and Prasanjit Podar, a case I'm sure you're all familiar with. This has very specific criteria, which is the patient has to communicate to a psychotherapist a serious threat of physical violence against a reasonably identifiable victim. So I hear people all the time say, oh, well, that guy said he was going to go out and kill a bunch of people. He told his mom that. Like, this is a Tarasov. Well, unless his mom is also a psychotherapist, it's not really. And unless all of those people are reasonably identifiable, it doesn't actually qualify. But this is why Tarasov warnings are supposed to also go through the police just protecting the party doesn't discharge your duty. The police have to notify DOJ that this is now a prohibited person in the state of California. Um, and this is Laura Wilcox, who was a young woman who was shot and killed in a mental health clinic where she worked by a patient who came in. And because of her, we have uh, Laura's Law now in California, and her mom has also become a very big advocate for good gun policy, um, and I've worked a bit with her. Laura's Law is our involuntary outpatient treatment program, and this also is something that triggers just within California a firearm prohibition for the duration of the treatment. Although interestingly, in 2013, there was an executive order clarifying that outpatient commitment had been intended to fall under the adjudicated as a mental defective clause and would require um, a federal prohibition. This is relevant because the Virginia Tech massacre of 2007, the man who perpetrated that, should have been federally prohibited under this. He had been remanded to, uh, by a court for stalking some women at a school. He'd been remanded to outpatient treatment. He had never gone, but that in and of itself should have been reported to the federal government and should have prohibited him from being able to buy the guns that he legally purchased. Um, okay, so let's look at whether or not this system of all these prohibitions targeted at people with mental illness is actually having an effect. Um, again, Jeff Swanson has done some research on this. He looked at people in Florida because of the way the system was set up. It was easy to get records. And so he looked at 80,000 people with serious mental illness in the county mental health system in Florida. He looked at gun suicides, violent gun crimes, and who of those people had firearm prohibitions. So they all had serious mental illness, but not all of them had reached the thresholds by which they would have been prohibited persons. Here's what he found. Um, this is the pie showing arrests for violent gun crime. 
And of the people with serious mental illness who were then later arrested for violent gun crime, almost half of them had, and this is the red, criminal disqualifications. Only a very small sliver in the yellow had exclusively a mental health disqualification from owning a firearm, and then the stripey is uh, they had both. So you can see here that having mental health disqualifications for people with serious mental illness is only going to affect a very small people, a very small slice of this pie of people who are committing violent crime. When he looked at gun suicides, he found a similar pattern, that many more people who completed suicide with a gun in this population actually had criminal disqualifications than had mental health disqualifications, although a larger number of them, or a larger proportion of them, had mental health disqualifications in this case. Not surprising as suicide is more closely correlated with mental illness than violence. But interestingly about gun suicides, as you can see from the three quarters of this pie that's green, most of the people who completed suicide with a gun had no disqualifications from owning it whatsoever. So his takeaways about the policy are that most people with serious mental illness who are arrested for gun violence would have been disqualified through the criminal system, not the mental health system. And the same was actually true for suicide, although far fewer people were disqualified. So our prohibitions were not really working to decrease violence in this um, in this state because the criminals were still able to get guns. Half of them shouldn't have had them and were still able to obtain them. And the prohibitions weren't working for suicide prevention because they didn't apply to the majority of the people who completed suicide. Um, we've also seen some studies come out about background checks and the, whether or not the Brady Act has had a significant impact on decreasing suicide and violence in the United States. Not really surprising to anyone, it hasn't. And that's largely because, well, first of all, there's a lot of holes in the database. Second of all, there's holes in the system of how the database is used. And third of all, it's such a big um, heterogeneous way that it's applied around the country that we haven't actually seen effects. But we have seen effects of policy that has targeted specifically um, people who are at high risk. We've seen that reduce risk. So one of the things we have to think about when we think about sensible firearm policy is how do we, rather than having this big blast shotgun approach across the nation, how do we pick out people who have an increased risk because of alcohol, early psychosis, domestic violence, prior history of violence, and how do we target those folks? We've seen decreases in, um, in firearm violence in previous uh, people who responded to domestic violence restraining orders and had their firearms removed. We've seen it in California with people who have violent misdemeanors on their record. Normally that wouldn't be federally prohibiting, but in California we do prohibit that and that has reduced violent crime in that group. So really targeting the high-risk people has helped. Um, I'm gonna talk about one piece of policy that has been um, set up to do that in California. And this is the one that I've done some work with creating and have testified about called the Gun Violence Restraining Order. How many folks here have heard of this? Ooh. Okay, um, so this is a piece of legislation that was passed after the Isla Vista shooting in Santa Barbara in 2014. Well, the, the law was passed in 2014. I think the shooting was in 2013, where a young man had um, been posting increasingly disturbing things online, including this Day of Retribution video that he put on YouTube, making it pretty clear that he planned to do something quite violent and drastic. Um, his uh, family was so concerned about him that his parents had called the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department and asked them to do a welfare check. They had gone to his house. When they came to the door, when he answered the door, he looked clean, well put together. He was polite. He answered all of the questions properly. No, I'm not suicidal. No, I'm not homicidal. No, I don't have a history of mental illness. Just was having a little bit of rough time. Sorry about those postings. All a big misunderstanding. The one thing they didn't do was check what California has, which is a database of all legal gun owners, to see that he had recently purchased a number of semi-automatic weapons and a whole cache of ammo that was in his closet. But even if they had done that, they didn't necessarily have recourse to take it away because he hadn't broken any laws and he was legally allowed to own it. So they were in a bind. And then a week later, he perpetrated this mass shooting. Well, the gun violence restraining order is targeted just at people like that and at people like the Parkland shooter and at people like so, so many of these other shooters where the warning signs are there, the police know they're dangerous, they're scaring other kids at their school. There's actually no legal recourse at this point to intervene and take away their guns. What the gun violence restraining order allows is for family members or police to petition to have somebody's gun removed based on a concern for violence in the near future. When we were coming up with the you know, specifics of this law, physicians and mental health providers were originally on it. 
But there was so much back and forth about like, okay, what physicians and what mental health providers? And should it be psychiatrists only in mental health? Or should it be all doctors? What about urologists? Do they really need to use this? And so it got so complicated. And then it was like, well, what about HIPAA? And then, oh, we should just mandate it. Well, nobody likes to be mandated. We all hate that about Tarasoff. And it was just, so we ended up just for the sake of simplicity, taking it off. But this, this part of it has come back and is back, has gone back through the legislature about putting, um, I think this year there was a bill to put physicians, school administrators, and one other group as people who could petition for one of these orders. It sounds like the kind of thing that nobody would buy, right? Like anyone can say that they're just gonna come take my guns away. But it's modeled really closely after a domestic violence restraining order, and I think that's part of why it's been so well received, is that people understand that. People understand that in the hot crisis of a domestic violence incident, you gotta get the guns out of the house really quick and then sort it out later. And the process is very similar, as we'll talk about in a minute. Um, one of the things I really fought for, although it's, it's funny how hard I had to fight because I kept coming back to this, there's no mental health history and no mental health evaluation inherently as part of this order. Yes, maybe this person needs to get into help later. Maybe they might need some outpatient therapy. Maybe in the case of threats of suicide, they might even need a hospitalization. That's not the point. The gun violence restraining order doesn't care if you have a mental illness, it just cares if you're making threats of violence or behaviors indicating you might be violent. The way it works in California, there's two types. One's the yellow, the emergency GVRO, and that is what law enforcement can file for. They can get to a house and, you know, there can, you know, a wife calls and says, my husband, he's drunk, he says he's going to kill himself, he's got his gun, I don't know what to do. They show up on scene, they can call right away, get an order from a judge, file a gun violence restraining order, get all the guns out of the house. Um, the ex parte order is more like the domestic violence restraining order for family members. They have to go down to the courthouse, file the order, and wait for it to be served by the sheriff. The sheriff can then remove the firearms from the house. This all happens very fast, and, and both of these, the respondent doesn't have a choice. They get to go to court within two weeks. The law enforcement agency holds on to their firearms, and then if in court the judge decides that they are still a threat, they will have their uh, GVRO continued for six months or a year. If the judge decides they're not a threat, this was all a big misunderstanding, then they can give the firearms back. Um, there's, Indiana and Connecticut had similar laws on the books for a decade or two before California passed theirs, but they were only, uh, theirs were only able to be filed by law enforcement, and they call them the risk warrant laws. There's also uh, other states who call theirs the extreme risk protection order, or ERPO. Um, and then you may have heard of them by the name Red Flag Law. Does this sound more familiar to people, the Red Flag Laws? Yeah. So it's funny because the, the group that I work with on this policy, um, they were really against the term Red Flag Law, and they fought this battle really hard. Like, we want journalists to stop using it. No one was allowed to say in presentations. But this year, the term Red Flag Law made it into the Oxford English Dictionary, and I was like, we're done. We lost that battle. Um, on the plus side, red flag laws have really caught on, and now there are 17 states who have enacted them, and four with bills proposed, and the federal government is considering such a law backed by Marco Rubio for cases of people who are threatening violence or suicide with a firearm. Jeff Swanson, again, has looked at some of the data about how these laws have worked in Connecticut, because Connecticut's risk warrant law has been on the books for a while. And in 14 years, there were 762 of these warrants issued. Um, interestingly, after the Virginia Tech shooting, which happened fairly nearby Connecticut, they really skyrocketed in the frequency with which they were used. Of the 762 risk warrants, uh, firearms were recovered in 99% of the cases. So these are really being filed on the people who do have access to guns. And on average, they had seven guns per person. Connecticut. Um, so the typical risk warrant subject was a middle-aged or older man, and as correlates, suicidality or self-injury was responsible for the majority of the threats that were made. Um, and what he found was that of the 762 people, 21 of them went on to die by suicide later, which means that that group, if you look at the um, number of deaths by suicide, has a suicide rate 40 times the average in their state. So this is a high-risk group of people, and they all have guns, except for that 1%. Um, six of those 21 suicides were by firearm, which means they got them from somewhere, who knows, but that's about half of the national average. So even though 40 times the number of people 
expected died by suicide, much fewer of them had access to firearms. So what they did was they took that with, um, they took that information and did some really complicated math involving what the case fatality rates are from firearms, from other methods, how many suicide attempts would have been expected from this group. And what they calculated was that for every 10 to 20 risk warrants that were issued, one life was saved. That's a pretty good number needed to treat in medicine, right? Like the statin numbers for heart attack and stroke are like two or three times this. Um, so depending on how big of a deal you think it is to remove somebody's guns in a civil order for six months or a year, this could be a really uh, effective piece of legislation for saving lives. In California, um, we have not had our policy on the books for long enough to get a really big piece of data, but the folks, again, that I work with down at the Firearm Violence Prevention Center have done a study about just case reports where our GVRO was used to prevent mass shootings in particular. So they looked at 159 gun violence restraining orders that they could get information on. There's been a lot more filed, but that's what they could get from the courts. 21 of those cases were used because somebody threatened or exhibited behaviors that were really concerning for a mass shooting. And um, not surprisingly, the average subject, again, was a white male, and the age, average age was 35. Of these 21 cases, they removed 52 firearms. And only four of these cases arose from a primary mental health concern, which I think is interesting. And I'm, I'm also glad to see that people are using this in those situations because oftentimes prior to the GVRO, people would think, oh, well, I'll just get the police out, they'll file a 5150, and then this person can't have their guns. Forgetting that there's this whole process that has to happen where, you know, depending on the system, they go to the ER, and then they go to a hospital, and then they have to go to the hearings. There's a lot of steps where that person could fall out of the system and still be able to buy firearms. If you're really worried about gun violence, mental illness or not, a GVRO might be a faster way to act. Um, so in those 21 cases, the, there were threats of terrorist attacks, workplace shootings, domestic violence incidents, and school shootings where a GVRO was used. We can't know how many of those would have actually happened if the GVRO hadn't been filed, but I will say that there's two of these cases where the GVRO kicked in while the person was in the waiting period for buying a semi-automatic weapon. And one of these was a man who had made some terrorist threats um, and had claimed he was going to shoot up a, a school or a church. He had ties to some extremist organizations. And he had purchased a semi-automatic pistol and was in the waiting period, the 10-day waiting period that California has, to pick it up. And when he went down to the shop to pick it up, the shop owner, as he was supposed to, ran his name through the database discovered that concerned parties had filed a GVRO against him and was unable to release the gun to him. So kind of concerning that it might have actually gone to completion. OK, so what can we all do? Um, psychiatrists in practice, how many of you guys think that your patients are vulnerable to firearm violence, more so than you know other specialties? Some folks do, OK. So, when, when psychiatrists are surveyed, the majority of them perceive firearm issues to be affecting their patients more than the general population. And this is true not just because, you know, it's not because our patients are out there committing mass shootings for the most part. Our patients often live in impoverished neighborhoods, on the street, in places where they're more vulnerable to crime. So they're almost more likely to be, um, I mean, they're definitely more likely to be victims of firearm violence, but they are more likely to be victims of suicide also. So. But concerningly, 45% of the psychiatrists surveyed said they never actually thought about discussing guns with their patients. Um, this is about on par with other specialties where people say, like, yeah, I think it's a big problem in the emergency room or elsewhere, and then they don't address it or document about it. Psychiatry training directors, how many of you guys in residency have had specialized training or any, like, didactics or anything about firearms? Yes, okay, a couple people. Um, so training directors surveyed, 55% of them said in their own practice they routinely screened patients, but the vast majority had not thought about providing training to the trainees. And I think that this is something that I found is that people really want to know more information about this, but there's not a specific module or class or clinical setting where it's really covered. Um, so a few things about talking to your patients about it. One of the biggest ones is assessing risk. We all have so much we have to do. Nobody is recommending that we do this on every single patient. Probably a psychiatrist, we're going to be doing it on more patients, but like during that psychoanalytic therapy session that you're doing every week for five years, it's probably not your opener, you know, every time. Um, so people who are at risk are patients with dementia, patients with cognitive disorders, 
Anybody who's in that window of early psychosis that's at an increased risk, alcohol abusers, um, people who have been victims of or perpetrators of domestic violence, if that's going on in the home, anytime there's children in a home with unsecured guns, and anybody who's making threats of suicide or violence should be considered for having this discussion. For us, I feel like this pretty much covers all of our patients, but maybe you'll find a few that don't fit into this rubric. Um, and then bringing this up with patients, and this is what can be really hard for people, because I think people who haven't been around guns or aren't familiar with different kinds of them, we often don't know how to broach the subject. We don't know how our patients will react. So it's important not to say things like, you don't own any of these terrible guns, do you? You gotta get those out. But talk about them and say, you know, lots of patients own guns for hunting or self-protection. Do you have any guns? Normalize it. Be able to ask them about what kinds of guns they have, how they keep them, why they own them. You know, there's a difference between having a handgun locked, sorry, unlocked and loaded in your nightstand drawer for self-protection versus having your hunting rifles in your storage unit. Um, and inquire about their knowledge about the risks so that you can provide education about different options. And those options will vary very much with the clinical situation. But as providers, it's really important that we're educated about what tools we have available. So in some cases, if somebody is acutely suicidal and has a gun at home and has been, you know, each night kind of holding it, considering using it, a 5150 might be in order. In cases where they're making specific threats to you, a Tarasoff might be in order. Maybe it's just a matter of counseling somebody about safe storage because it's a child psychiatry visit for ADHD, but you find out that the kid's been playing with dad's gun. Um, there are some programs, this is trickier in California, but where you can actually voluntarily give your firearms up and have them babysat by a law enforcement agency or a hunting buddy or whatever it is, you know, if you're in a troubled time. Um, or a gun violence restraining order may be something that we use plus or minus a 5150, but those two things aren't necessarily, they don't cover all the same ground, so there may be cases in which both might be appropriate. Um, for those of you who are interested in learning more about this, I, I want to, I don't always say this, but I want to thank the NRA um, because this is a tweet that the NRA sent out about a year ago, maybe a little more, that says someone should tell self-important anti-gun doctors to stay in their lane. Half of the articles in Annals of Internal Medicine are pushing for gun control. Most upsetting, however, the medical community seems to have consulted no one but themselves. This caused this huge tweet storm of doctors of all specialties all over the country posting pictures of operating rooms with blood all over the floor, telling stories about patients who had died by suicide with the hashtag, this is our lane. And it went viral and it became a huge movement. It got a bunch of people involved. And um, I, I have them really to thank for this new position that I'm gonna be taking up at Davis, that we, uh, the state of California just gave almost $4 million for the dissemination and development of a curriculum to teach mental health and medical providers about firearm violence prevention in their patients. So how do you talk to patients? What are the risky situations? What tools do you have? What resources can you give your patients? Um, so I'm actually, as Sophie mentioned, I'm gonna be leading this project. It's really brand new, so I don't have a lot more to give you guys, like I literally started yesterday. Um, so, uh, but it's, it's a really exciting project and I'm sure that you'll, I hope that you'll all be hearing more about it. We're calling it the Bullet Points Project. And we're going to develop this curriculum tailored for health professionals, different kinds of specialties, um, different stages of training, so med students all the way to physicians in practice, and different patient populations that are at risk with ongoing evaluation of the program as we do it. Um, so stay tuned for that. A few resources for those of you who are interested. The Speak for Safety website is our gun violence restraining order website for California. It's really geared towards law enforcement and family members who can apply for these. But if you're interested about it or you have a patient where you really want you know, mom or girlfriend or whoever to consider a GVRO to, to increase patient safety, or you have a law enforcement officer who's never heard of it and you think it might be a good time for it, you can send them to this website. Um, the What You Can Do website is a, it's kind of like a mini bullet points project that um, is more national resources, so it's not as Cal California specific, but it has a lot of important information, good journal articles, slides about the epidemiology of gun violence. So the What You Can Do website um, is a great place to visit. And then if you just want to read one article about gun violence prevention for physicians, this Annals of Internal Medicine uh, in the clinic article that came out this year is a really great resource of just kind of everything you need to know in one place. Um, you can also uh, check out the What You Can Do website, which is here, and follow, if you're on Twitter, the What You Can Do initiative and Bullet Point CA. 
we, as of this morning, had zero followers. Um, so if you get on there and you're like, this can't be a real site because there's no logo and no followers, that's us. You got it. You can be the first ones, um, but it will be happening soon. So that is the end. Thank you very much. And I'll have an answer questions if folks have those. You want a mic? Thank you very much. Do you have questions? Thank you. Oh, yes. Dr. Squaw, you know about guns. I didn't understand the slide that had 90% on it. People that you, you take away their guns and they find another way oh, to kill themselves. Yes. I think that, could you go back and show that? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty minimalistic slide, but it's a good question. So this is the percent of people, sorry, I can't, the percent of people who make a very serious suicide attempt and do not go on to die by another attempt. And so, but it doesn't say that. It says who go on to die. Oh gosh. No, who got sorry, who go on to die by other means. Yeah. It is a it's a convoluted way. They go on to die by heart attack or oh, cancer. Oh, means or, sounded like another yeah, suicide. You're right. Attempt. It's confusingly worded. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, not suicide. They go on to die by not if suicide. If it said go on to die naturally. I will yeah, that's yeah, that's so better. Right. I've had people be confused by this before. Sorry. One. <laughs> well, thank you so much for a, a timely topic. Hopefully, at some point in the future, it won't be so timely because right. this will not be I on our, our conscious so much. Um, I, I wanted to go back to the, the the first part of your presentation. I was wondering about um, how the calculus changes or how the how the risks change when you just look at mass shootings um, or high profile uh, like assassinations. So. My understanding is that if you take gun violence in totality, the, the number of uh, incidences perpetrated by someone with SMI is fairly low. But if you're just looking at just mass shootings or high-profile assassinations, does the risk of uh, SMI contributing to that uh, increase or change? Yeah, great question. So just looking at mass shootings, what is, what's the contribution of mental illness? Um, this is a really complicated question and it's very controversial. First of all, it depends on how you define mass shootings. So if we define mass shootings as four or more people, um, and depending on if you're at the FBI or other agencies, you can include the perpetrator in that or not. So four or more people killed in a single incident. You know, the majority of those are actually domestic violence incidents and um, gang or criminal activity. So I usually think about it as public mass shootings. So random targets, the perpetrator didn't know most of them in a public space. If you look at those, the incidence of severe mental illness contributing probably goes up. But unfortunately, very few of these guys have, um, and I say guys, there have been a few women, very few of them have clear diagnoses before. Very few of them have been prohibited through the mental health system. So almost none of them have had a history of like psychiatric hospitalizations. What, they, what we do see is this melange of OCD, depression, autism spectrum disorders, ADHD diagnoses, you know, a little bit of Risperdal trial here and there as a teenager. It's kind of all this vague stuff of like, these people aren't quite right, but they don't fit neatly in the box of a specific diagnosis. There have been a few folks who have been like pretty clearly psychotic. And um, I'll, the Gabrielle Gifford shooting was one, the Aurora movie theater was one where they were later found incompetent to stand trial and treated for schizophrenia. And it's likely that they were in the early throes of their break or even later in the throes and they just hadn't really been picked up by the by the mental health system. But more than that, I think it's the people we see who are perpetrating school shootings and these, you know, shootings out of anger and revenge, we see them motivated more by like personality cluster A traits and some, you know, um, sociopathy and narcissism thrown in there. So whether or not you define those as mental illness gets kind of tricky. Oh. Um, you showed a, a slide regarding the um, the added or the additive risk of having um, substance use, um, and it was the general population, those with serious mental illness, and then sort of mental illness plus. Um, and uh, I was wondering, in terms of it, if you were to look at general population plus substance without mental health diagnosis, how much just the presence of substance increases their, uh, I guess, lethality or, or risk of danger. Are you talking about this slide? 
it's funny though, because there's a third slide that looks just like these that I took out that is the two together and the odds ratio is like 10, but I just took it out because I said it. But yeah, so with this is with no mental illness, the risk, it's like seven times the risk of perpetrating violence. So I actually have a question about this violence. Is, is this specifically gun violence? Because <coughs> one other thing I have, I've always wondered about my seriously mentally ill patients is that they have thought disorders and they, the ability of them to organize themselves to get guns is typically um, very poor, but, but hitting people is, is fairly easy. Yes, and I, I may have not been super clear about that. This is non-firearm violence. This is community violence, as is this. Oops, wait, this one. Um, that's community violence, and this one is community violence. So not specifically firearm. And you're right, it is much easier and more common for our folks with serious mental illness to perpetrate you know, hand violence than gun violence because there's a process in California you have to go through and you have to really be able to think it through. And I do think that that is part of what um, is a little bit of a gatekeeper for folks with serious mental illness perpetrating mass shootings. The people we see doing that, I mean, they're planning this out. They're like getting the, the blueprints for the buildings. They're casing the joints. They're doing this for months. And that takes a lot of organization and pre-planning. And a lot of our very seriously mentally ill folks, they're just trying to hold it together. Can I ask one more question? Um, so I was possibly under the, the wrong understanding that when a person is put on a 5150, they're not allowed to have guns for five years in the state of California. And we've actually had... Um, cases like on inpatient where a patient has been admitted. Um, I believe this case was at the VA. And then he said like, yeah, and my car is parked in the parking lot and it's full of guns. And we called the police and they took away all his guns. Um, is that is that not how it works? So um, the key word that I heard from that was that he was admitted to a hospital. There's a clause, actually I have a slide for this. I'll put it in at the end because I get a lot of the same questions. Um, Here's the back side of the 5150. I'm sure nobody can read what this says, but just so you guys know where it is if you want to read the form. What it says on there is that if, if I'm a police officer and I go to somebody's house and they're sitting there contemplating suicide with their you know, loaded pistol in their lap, it allows for temporary removal of the gun in their possession when I detain them for an emergency evaluation. If I bring them to the ER, they sober up, they say, oh gosh, I, I was just kidding, I'm not suicidal at all, I have so much to live for. The ER sends them home, they never make it. I, I don't know if it works down here. Do people go to the ER first on 5150s here? Okay. And they never get admitted to a psychiatric hospital. I, I can take their gun and kind of hang on to it for a minute, but they have a right to get it back and they have a right to buy another one. If that person goes to the ER, gets admitted to a psychiatric hospital like the VA and is in a psychiatric hospital, in California, we do have a five-year prohibition for that. Now that person lands on a list. Now they can't buy a firearm because there will be a background check. Now we can legally remove any other firearms they have in the home, their storage unit that they lent to their hunting buddy. We, get, we can take them all out because they're a prohibited person. But the 5150 itself just allows for the temporary emergency removal of firearms in their possession at the time. And that's why a GVRO can be helpful. You know, if you're not really sure that person's going to make it far enough into the system, the GVRO can be like a helpful backup. For example, that guy who was at the hot, you know, he was admitted so you can go take his guns out of his car. But if he hadn't been, he's just going to drive home. So I have a political question. Oh. <laughs> I mean, the fact is that uh, at the basis of all this, yes, are our national guns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's the old idea that in 1776, if you had a blunderbuss, you could kill somebody. Mm -hmm. And you, you were part of the militia, you were doing it for good causes. But it used to take a long time to load it. Yeah. And so by the time you loaded it the second time, somebody probably would have knocked you over. Now we have mass shootings mm -hmm. with people who have extraordinary firepower in, their, in, in this machine they're holding. What are the doctors in the country? You mentioned in passing, you said, oh, it was outrage, yes? On the part of the, the NRA said, well, doctors should stay in their lane. And you say, oh, there was an outrage. But I think that disappeared after a while. And my question then is, what does the average physician, either individually or collectively, have as a resource to change some of the laws that would make it less 
uh, likely that somebody who is wanting to kill themselves or somebody else, particularly somebody else, has the capacity to essentially machine gun a whole bunch of people. That's a great what, question. What are we doing about that as, well, as physicians? Because we're supposed to be the guardian of health. Mm -hmm. And, and that's where physicians, we, when we, the outrage may have died a little bit, but I have seen it turn into action on some level. There's been a lot more research. So there's, um, I mean, the funding from the state of California for this curriculum, the, um, the laws about what the CDC is allowed to fund have changed. So the Dickey Amendment that prohibited using federal funds to advocate for gun control have been loosened somewhat. There's still not money there, but there's a lot of private money springing up to do more research about evidence-based policies. There are a ton of young researchers who are wanting to get involved in this kind of work. And I think just specifically about the high capacity weapons, we've seen a number of states ban, you know, because states can pass their own laws that are more stringent than the federal government. California recently raised the age that you need to be to buy a long gun, a rifle or a shotgun to 21 from 18. We banned bump stocks. Um, we banned uh, some other high capacity uh, magazines. I forget exactly what. There's been bans on some of the higher capacity weapons. So we're seeing people kind of piecemeal together getting rid of the really lethal machinery. But it's obviously got a long way to go. The MRA is slowly. We hope so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there is evidence that yeah. the MRA is slowly going broke. Yes, Perhaps. right. They're having some problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we're out of time. If you have questions, by come up and ask them. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me.